The Gulag Archipelago, Volume 1, Section 2, Continued. Cassette 6, Side 2. And during those 13 days in solitary, to which Rappaport had been moved, only a medical assistant looked in now and then. No doctor came, and no one from the administration took the slightest interest in what he was demanding with his hunger strike. They never even asked him. The only attention the administration paid him was to search his cell carefully, and they managed to dig out some hidden makorka and several matches. What Rappaport wanted was to put an end to the interrogator's humiliation of him. He had prepared for his hunger strike in a thoroughly scientific way. He had received a food parcel earlier, and so he ate only butter and ring-shaped rolls, baranki, and he quit eating black bread a week before his strike. He starved until he could see the light through his hands. He recalls experiencing a sensation of lightheadedness and clarity of thought. At a certain moment, a kindly, compassionate woman jailer named Marussia came to his cell and whispered to him, Stop your hunger strike. It isn't going to help. You'll just die. You should have done it a week earlier. He listened to her and called off his hunger strike without having gotten anywhere at all. Nevertheless, they gave him hot red wine and a roll, and afterward the jailers took him back to the common cell in a hand carry. A few days later, his interrogation began again. But the hunger strike had not been entirely useless. The interrogator had come to understand that Rappaport had willpower enough and no fear of death, and he eased up on the interrogation. Well, now it turns out you are quite a wolf, the interrogator said to him. A wolf, Rappaport affirmed, and I'll certainly never be your dog. Rappaport declared another hunger strike later on, at the Kotlas Transit Prison. But it turned out somewhat comically. He announced that he was demanding a new interrogation, and that he would not board the prisoner transport. They came to him on the third day. Get ready for the prisoner transport. You don't have the right. I'm on a hunger strike. At that point, four young toughs picked him up, carried him off, and tossed him into the bath. After the bath, they carried him to the guardhouse. With nothing else left to do, Rappaport stood up and went to join the column of prisoners boarding the prisoner transport. After all, there were dogs and bayonets at his back. And that is how the new type prison defeated bourgeois hunger strikes. Even a strong man had no way left him to fight the prison machine, except perhaps suicide. But is suicide really resistance? Isn't it actually submission? The SR, Yekaterina Olitskaya, thinks that the Trotskyites, and subsequently the communists who followed them into prison, did a great deal to weaken the hunger strike as a weapon for fighting back. They declared hunger strikes too easily and lifted them too easily. She says that even the Trotskyite leader, Ian Smirnov, after going on a hunger strike four days before their Moscow trial, quickly surrendered and lifted it. They say that up to 1936 the Trotskyites rejected any hunger strike against the Soviet government on principle and never supported SRs and social democrats who were on hunger strikes. But they always demanded support for themselves from the SRs and social democrats. On a prisoner transport to Karakanda and the Kolyma in 1936, there dressed as traitors and provocateurs all those who refused to sign their telegram to Kalinin, protesting against sending the vanguard of the revolution, that is themselves, to the Kolyma. The story was told by Makotinsky. Let history say how true or untrue that reproach is. However, no one paid for hunger strikes so much and so grievously as the Trotskyites. We will come to their hunger strikes and their strikes in camps in part three. Excessive haste in declaring and lifting hunger strikes was probably characteristic of impetuous temperaments which reveal their feelings too quickly. But there were, after all, such natures, such characters, among the old Russian revolutionaries too, and there were similar temperaments in Italy and France. But nowhere, either in pre-revolutionary Russia, in Italy or in France, were the authorities so successful in discouraging hunger strikes as in the Soviet Union.
There was probably no less physical sacrifice and no less spiritual determination in the hunger strikes in the second quarter of our century than there had been in the first. But there was no public opinion in the Soviet Union. And on that basis, the new type prison waxed and grew strong. And instead of easy victories, the prisoners suffered hard-earned defeats. Decades passed, and time produced its own results. The hunger strike, the first and most natural weapon of the prisoner, in the end became alien and incomprehensible to the prisoners themselves. Fewer and fewer desired to undertake them. And to prison administrations, the whole thing began to seem either plain stupidity or else a malicious violation. When, in 1960, Gennady Smelov, a non-political offender, declared a lengthy hunger strike in the Leningrad prison, the prosecutor went to his cell for some reason, perhaps he was making his regular rounds, and asked him, Why are you torturing yourself? And Smelov replied, Justice is more precious to me than life. This phrase so astonished the prosecutor with its irrelevance that the very next day Smelov was taken to the Leningrad Special Hospital, that is, the insane asylum, for prisoners. And the doctor there told him, We suspect you may be a schizophrenic. Along the rings of the horn, where it began to narrow to its point, the former central prisons arose, rechristened, by the beginning of 1937, the special isolators. The last little weaknesses were now being squeezed out of the system, the last vestiges of light and air, and the hunger strike of the tired socialists, their numbers sparse by now, in the Yaroslav penalty isolator at the beginning of 1937, was one of their last desperate efforts. They were still demanding that everything should be restored to what it once had been, they were demanding both the election of spokesmen and free communication between cells. But it is unlikely that even they had hopes of this any longer. By a fifteen-day hunger strike, even though it ended with their being force-fed through a tube, they had apparently succeeded in defending some portions of their regimen, a one-hour period outdoors, access to the provincial newspaper, notebooks for their writing. These they kept but the authorities promptly took away their personal belongings and threw at them the common prison clothing of the special isolator. And a little while later, they cut half an hour off their time outdoors, and then they reduced it by another 15 minutes. These were the same people who were being dragged through a sequence of prisons and exiles according to the rules of the big solitaire. Some hadn't lived an ordinary decent human life for ten years, some for fifteen. All they had was this meagre prison life with hunger strikes to boot. A few who had gotten used to winning out over the prison administrations before the revolution were still alive. However, before the revolution, they were marching in step with time against a weakening enemy. And now time was against them and allied with an enemy growing steadily stronger. Among them were young people, too. How strange that seems to us nowadays. Those who considered themselves... SRs, social democrats, or anarchists, even after the parties themselves had been battered out of existence. And the only future these new recruits had to look forward to was life in prison. The loneliness surrounding the entire prison struggle of the socialists, which became more hopeless with every year that passed, grew more and more acute, approaching a vacuum in the end. That was not how it had been under the Tsar throw open the prison doors, and the public greeted them with flowers. Now they leafed through the newspapers and saw that they were being drenched in vituperation, with slops, even. For it was the socialists, after all, whom Stalin saw as the most dangerous enemies of his socialism. And the people were silent. And what could give them any reason to dare suppose that the people had any kindly feelings left toward those that they had not long before elected to the Constituent Assembly? And finally, the newspapers stopped showering profanity on them, because Russian socialists had by that time come to seem so unimportant and so impotent and even non-existent. By this time, these socialists were remembered outside in freedom only as something belonging to the past, the distant past. And young people hadn't the slightest idea that SRs and Mensheviks were still alive somewhere. And in the sequence of Chimkent and Cherdin exile, and the Verkne, Uralsk, and Vladimir isolators, 
How could they not tremble in their dark, solitary confinement cells, cells with muzzles by this time, and feel that perhaps their program and their leaders had been mistaken, that perhaps their tactics and actions had been mistaken too? And all their actions began to seem nothing but inaction, and their lives devoted only to suffering a fatal delusion. Their lonely prison struggle had been essentially undertaken for all of us, for all future prisoners, even though they themselves might not think so nor understand this, for how we would exist in imprisonment and how we would be kept there. And if they had one out, then probably nothing of what happened to us would have happened, nothing of what this book is about, all seven of its parts. But they were beaten. They failed to protect either themselves or us. In part, too... The canopy of loneliness spread over them because, in the very first post-revolutionary years, having naturally accepted from the GPU the well-merited identification of politicals, they naturally agreed with the GPU that all who were to the right of them, beginning with the cadets, were not politicals but KRs, counter-revolutionaries, the manure of history. I do not like these left and right classifications. They are conditional concepts, they are loosely banded about, and they do not convey the essence. And they also regarded as KRs those who suffered for their faith in Christ, and whoever didn't know what right or left meant, and that in the future would be all of us, they considered to be KRs also. And thus it was that, in part voluntarily, in part involuntarily, keeping themselves aloof and shunning others, they gave their blessing to the future fifty-eight, into whose maw they themselves would disappear. Objects and actions change their aspect quite decisively, depending on the position of the observer. In this chapter, we have been describing the prison stand of the socialists from their point of view. And, as you see, it is illuminated by a pure and tragic light. But those K.R.s whom the politicals treated so contemptuously on Solovki, those K.R.s recall the politicals in their own way. Those politicals, what a nasty crowd they were. They looked down their noses at everyone else. They stuck to their own group. They demanded their own special rations all the time and their own special privileges. And they kept quarreling among themselves incessantly. And how can one but feel that there is truth here too? All those fruitless and endless arguments which by now are merely comical and those demands for additional rations for themselves in comparison with the masses of the hungry and impoverished. In the Soviet period, the honorable appellation of politicals turned out to be a poisoned gift. And then another reproach followed immediately. Why was it that the socialists, who used to escape so easily under the Tsar, had become so soft in Soviet prisons? Where are their escapes? In general, there were quite a few escapes, but who can remember any socialists among them? And in turn, those prisoners to the left of the socialists, the Trotskyites and the communists, shunned the socialists, considering them exactly the same kind of chaos as the rest, and they closed the moat of isolation around them with an encircling ring. The Trotskyites and the communists, each considering their own direction more pure and lofty than all the rest, despised and even hated the socialists and each other, who were imprisoned behind the bars of the same buildings and went outdoors to walk in the same prison courtyards. Yekaterina Olitskaya recalls that in 1937, at the transit prison on Vanino Bay, when the socialists called to each other across the fence between the men's and women's compounds, looking for fellow socialists and reporting news, the communists, Lisa Kotik and Maria Krutikova, were indignant because they might bring down punishment on them all by such irresponsible behavior. They said... All our misfortunes are due to those socialist rats. A profound explanation, and so dialectical, too. They should be choked. And those two girls in the Lubyanka in 1925, whom I have already mentioned, sang about spring and lilacs, only because one of them was an SR, and the second a member of the communist opposition, and they had no political song in common. And, in fact, the communist deviationist girl shouldn't really have joined the SR girl in her protest at all. And if in a Tsarist prison the different parties often joined forces in a common struggle, let us recall in this connection the escape from the Sevastopol Central Prison, in Soviet prisons each political group tried to ensure its own purity by steering clear of the others, 
The Trotskyites struggled on their own, apart from the socialists and communists. The communists didn't struggle at all, for how could one allow oneself to struggle against one's own government and one's own prison? It turned out in consequence that the communists in isolators and in prison for long termers were restricted earlier and more cruelly than others. In 1928, in the Yaroslavl Central Prison, the communist Nadezhda Surovtseva went outdoors for fresh air in a single file column that was forbidden to engage in conversation while the socialists were still chattering in their own groups. She was not permitted to tend the flowers in the courtyard because they had been left by previous prisoners who had struggled for their rights, and they deprived her of newspapers, too. However, the secret political department of the GPU permitted her to have complete sets of Marx and Engels, Lenin and Hegel in her cell. Her mother's visit to her took place virtually in the dark and her downcast mother died soon afterward. What must she have thought of her daughter's circumstances in prison? The difference between the treatment of socialist prisoners and that of the communists persisted many years, went far beyond this, and extended to a difference in rewards. In 1937 to 1938, the socialists were imprisoned like the rest, and they all got their tenors, too. But as a rule, they were not forced to denounce themselves. They had, after all, never hidden their own special individual views, which were quite enough to get them sentenced. But a communist had no special individual views, so what, then, was he to be sentenced for if a self-denunciation wasn't forced out of him? Even though the enormous archipelago was already spreading across the land, the prisons for long-termers didn't fall into decay. The old jail tradition was being zealously carried on, Everything new and invaluable which the archipelago had contributed to the indoctrination of the masses was still not enough in itself. The deficiency was provided for by the complementary existence of the tons, the special purpose prisons, and prisons for long termers in general. Not everyone swallowed up by the great machine was allowed to mingle with the natives of the archipelago. Well known foreigners, individuals who were too famous or who were being held secretly, purged gaibisti, could not by any means be seen openly in camps. Their hauling a barrow did not compensate for the disclosure and the consequent moral-political damage. This term actually exists, and it has a sky-blue, swampy coloration. In the same way, the socialists, who were engaged in a continuous struggle for their prison rights, could not conceivably be permitted to mingle with the masses, but had to be kept separately, and in fact suffocated separately, in view of their special privileges and rights. Much later on, in the fifties, as we shall learn later in this work, the special purpose prisons were also needed to isolate camp rebels, and in the last years of his life, disappointed in the possibilities of reforming thieves, Stalin gave orders that various ringleaders of the thieves should also get Tiorzak rather than camp. And then, to be sure, it was necessary for the state to support, free of charge in prison, those prisoners who, because of their feebleness, would have immediately died off in camp, and would thus have shirked their duty to serve out their terms. And others who couldn't possibly be used in camp work, like the blind Kopeikin, a man of seventy, who used to sit all day long in the market in Yuryevets on the Volga. His songs and facetious comments won him ten years for KRD, counter-revolutionary activity, but in his case they had to substitute prison for camp. The inventory of old jails, inherited from the Romanov dynasty, was of necessity looked after, remodeled, strengthened, and perfected. Certain central prisons, like the one Yaroslavl, were so well and suitably appointed, doors plated with iron, table, stool, and cot permanently anchored in each cell, that the only thing required to bring them up to date was the installation of muzzles on the windows and the fencing in of the courtyards where the prisoners walked in order to reduce them to the size of a cell. By 1937, all the trees on prison grounds had been cut down, all vegetable gardens ploughed under, and all grassy areas paved with asphalt. Others, like the one in Sudstal, required new equipment, and the monastery arrangement had to be remodelled, but after all, self-incarceration of a body in a monastery and its incarceration in a prison by the state 
serve physically similar purposes, and therefore the buildings were always easy to adapt. One of the buildings of the Sukhanovka monastery was adapted for use as a prison for long-termers. Of course, it was also necessary to make up for losses from the Tsarist infantry, the conversion of the Peter and Paul fortress in Leningrad and of Schlüsselburg near Leningrad into museums for tourists. The Vladimir Central Prison was expanded and added to, with a big new building constructed under Yezhov. It was heavily used and garnered many prisoners over those decades. We have already mentioned how the Tobolsk Central Prison was inaugurated and that Verk Uralsk was opened in 1925 for continuous and abundant use. To our misfortune, all these isolators are still in use and are in operation at the moment these lines are being written. From Tvardovsky's poem, Distance Beyond Distance, one can draw the conclusion that the Alexandrovsk Central Prison wasn't empty in Stalin's time either. We have less information about the one in Orel. It is feared that it suffered serious damage during World War II. But not far from it was the well-equipped prison for long-termers in Dmitrovsk-Olovsky. During the 20s, the prisoners' food was very decent in the isolators for politicals, still called politizakritki, political lock-ups, by the prisoners. The lunches always included some meat. Fresh vegetables were served. Milk could be bought in the commissary. In 1931 to 1933, the food deteriorated sharply, but things were no better out in freedom at that time. Both scurvy and dizziness from lack of food were no rarity in the prisons for politicals in those years. Later on, the food improved, but it was never the same as before. In 1947, in the Vladimir Ton, I. Korneyev was constantly hungry. One pound of bread, two pieces of sugar, two hot dishes which were not at all filling. The only thing available in unlimited quantities was boiling water. It will, of course, be said once more that this was not a typical year, and there was hunger outside in freedom, too, at the time. This was when they generously allowed freedom to feed prison. Unlimited parcels were permitted. The light in cells was always rationed, so to speak, in both the 30s and the 40s. The muzzles on the windows and the frosted reinforced glass created a permanent twilight in the cells. Darkness is an important factor in causing depression. They often stretched netting above the window muzzle, and in the winter it was covered with snow, which cut off this last access to the light. Reading became no more than a way of ruining one's eyes. In the Vladimir Ton, they made up for this lack of light at night. Bright electric lights burned all night long, preventing sleep. And in the Dmitrovsk prison in 1938, N.A. Kodzirev, there was light in the evenings and at night, a kerosene lamp on a little shelf way up near the ceiling that burned away and smoked up the last air. In 1939, there were electric lights that glowed red at half voltage. Air was rationed, too. The hinged panes for ventilation were kept locked and opened only during the interval of the prisoner's trip to the toilet, as prisoners recall from both Dmitrovsk and Yaroslavl prisons. Why Ginsburg? The bread grew mouldy between morning and lunchtime. The sheets were damp and the walls green. In Vladimir, in 1948, there was no lack of air because the transom was open permanently. Walks outdoors ranged from 15 to 45 minutes at various hours in various prisons. There was no such thing as the communication with the soil that had existed in Schlüsselburg or Solovki. Everything that grew had been torn up by the roots, trampled, covered with concrete and asphalt. They even forbade lifting up one's head to the heavens during the walks. Look at your feet! This was the command both Kozirev and Adamova remember from the Kazan prison. Visits from relatives were forbidden in 1937 and never renewed. Letters could be sent to close relatives twice a month and could be received from them in most years. But in Kazan they had to be returned to the administration the day after they had been read. Access to the commissary to make purchases with the money sent in specifically limited amounts was usually permitted. Furniture was no unimportant part of the prison regimen. Adamova wrote eloquently of her happiness at finding a simple wooden cot with a straw mattress and a simple wooden table in her cell at Suzdal, after having had only cots that folded into the wall and chairs anchored to the floor.
In the Vladimir town, I, Korneyev, experienced two different prison regimens. Under one, in 1947 to 1948, personal articles were not removed from the cell. One could lie down during the day, and the turnkey very seldom looked through the peephole. But under the other, in 1949 to 1953, the cell was locked with two locks, the responsibility of the turnkey and duty officer respectively. One was forbidden to lie down, forbidden to talk in a normal voice, in Kazan only in a whisper. Personal articles were all taken away. A uniform of striped mattress ticking was issued. Correspondence was permitted only twice a year, and only on those days announced without warning by the chief of the prison. Anyone who missed that day couldn't write. And only a sheet of paper half the size of a postal sheet could be used. Violent searches and unscheduled visits were frequent, requiring the complete turning out of one's belongings and undressing down to one's skin. Communication between cells was prohibited to such an extent that the jailers went through the toilets with a portable lantern after each toilet visit and searched in each hole. The entire cell would get punishment cells for graffiti in the toilets. The punishment cells were a scourge in the special purpose prisons. One could get into a punishment cell for coughing. Cover your head with your blanket, then you can cough. Or for walking around the cell. Kozirev, it was considered to be rebellious. For the noise made by one's shoes. In the Kazan prison, women had been issued men's shoes that were much too large for women's feet, size ten and a half. Incidentally, Ginsburg was correct in concluding that periods in a punishment cell were meted out not for any particular misdemeanor, but according to a schedule. Every prisoner was required to spend some time there in order to learn what it was like. And the rules included another generally applicable point. In the event of any display of unruliness in a punishment cell, the chief of the prison has the right to extend the term of incarceration there to twenty days. Just what was meant by unruliness. Here's what happened to Kozire. The descriptions of the punishment cell and much else in the prison regimen tally to such an extent among all sources that the stamp of a single system of administrative rules can be detected. He was given another five days in the punishment cell for pacing back and forth. In the autumn, the building containing the punishment cells was unheated, and it was very cold. They forced prisoners to undress down to their underwear and to take off their shoes. The floor was bare earth and dust. It might be wet dirt. And in the Kazan prison, it might even be covered with water. Kozirev had a stool in his. Ginsburg had none in hers. He immediately concluded that he would perish, that he would freeze to death. But some kind of mysterious inner warmth gradually made itself felt, and it was his salvation. He learned to sleep sitting on his stool. They gave him a mug of hot water three times a day. It made him drunk. One of the duty officers, in violation of the rules, pressed a piece of sugar into his ten-and-a-half-ounce bread ration. On the basis of the rations issued him, and by observing the light from some faraway, tiny, labyrinthine window, Kozirev kept count of the days. His five days had come to an end, but he had not been released. His sense of hearing had become extremely acute, and he heard whispers in the corridor, having to do with either the sixth or six days. This was a provocation. They were waiting for him to say that his five days were over, and that it was time to let him out. That would have constituted unruliness for which his stay in the punishment cell would have been prolonged. But he sat silent and obedient for another day, and then they let him out, just as if everything had been the way it was supposed to be. Perhaps the chief of the prison used this method for testing all the prisoners in turn for submissiveness, and then he could sentence all those who weren't yet submissive enough to further terms in the punishment cell. After the punishment cell, the ordinary cell seemed like a palace, Kozirev became deaf for half a year, and he began to get abscesses in his throat. His cellmate went insane from frequent imprisonment in the punishment cell, and Kozirev was kept locked up with an insane man for more than a year, with just the two of them there. Nadezhda Surovtseva recalls many cases of insanity in political isolators. She herself recalls as many as Novoruski totaled up in the whole chronicle of Schusselberg.
does it not at this point seem to the reader that we have gradually, step by step, mounted to the very point, the peak of the second horn, and that it is probably really higher than the first, and probably sharper too? But opinions are divided. With one voice, the old camp veterans consider the Vladimir Ton of the fifties a resort. That is how Vladimir Borosovich Zeldovich, sent there from Abbe's station, regarded it, and Anna Petrovna Skripnikova, who was sent there in 1956 from the Kamarovo camps. Skripnikova was particularly astonished at the regular dispatch every ten days of petitions and declarations. She even began to write, believe it or not, to the United Nations. And by the excellent library, including books in foreign languages, they used to bring the complete catalogue to the cell, and you made out a list for a whole year ahead. It is also necessary to keep in mind how elastic our law is. Thousands of women, wives, were sentenced to prison, to Tayozak, and then one fine day someone whistled, and they were transferred to camps. The Kolyma hadn't fulfilled the gold plan. And so they switched them without any trial or any court. In fact, does Tayozak actually exist at all, or is it only the vestibule for the camps? And only here, right here, is where our chapter ought to have begun. It ought to have examined that glimmering light which, in time, the soul of the lonely prisoner begins to emit, like the halo of a saint, torn from the hustle bustle of everyday life in so absolute a degree. That even counting the passing minutes puts him intimately in touch with the universe. The lonely prisoner has to have been purged of every imperfection, of everything that has stirred and troubled him in his former life, that has prevented his muddied waters from settling into transparency. How gratefully his fingers reach out to feel and crumble the lumps of earth in the vegetable garden, but alas, it is all asphalt. How his head rises of itself toward the eternal heavens, but alas. This is forbidden, and how much touching attention the little bird on the window sill arouses in him! But alas, there is that muzzle there, and the netting as well, and the hinged ventilation pane is locked. And what clear thoughts, what sometimes surprising conclusions he writes down on the paper issued him! But alas, only if you buy it in the commissary, and only if you turn it into the prison office when you have used it up for eternal safekeeping. But our peevish qualifications somehow interrupt our line of thought. The plan of our chapter creaks and cracks, and we no longer know the answer to the question: Is the soul of a person in the new type prison, in the special purpose prison, the ton, purified, or does it perish once and for all? If the first thing you see each and every morning is the eyes of your cellmate who has gone insane, how then shall you save yourself during the coming day? Nikolai Alexandrovich Kozirev, whose brilliant career in astronomy was interrupted by his arrest, saved himself only by thinking of the eternal and infinite, of the order of the universe, and of its supreme spirit, of the stars, of their internal state, and what time and the passing of time really are. And in this way, he began to discover a new field in physics. And only in this way did he succeed in surviving in the Dmitrovsk prison. But his line of mental exploration was blocked by forgotten figures. He could not build any further. He had to have a lot of figures. Now, just where could he get them in his solitary confinement cell with its overnight kerosene lamp, a cell into which not even a little bird could enter? And the scientist prayed, "Please, God, I have done everything I could. Please help me. Please help me continue." At this time, he was entitled to receive one book every ten days. By then he was alone in the cell. In the meagre prison library were several different editions of Demian Bedny's Red Concert, which kept coming around to each cell again and again. Half an hour passed after his prayer. They came to exchange his book, and as usual, without asking anything at all, they pushed a book at him. It was entitled A Course in Astrophysics. Where had it come from? He simply could not imagine such a book in the prison library. Aware of the brief duration of this coincidence, Kozirev threw himself on it and began to memorize everything he needed immediately, and everything he might need later on. In all, just two days had passed, and he had eight days left in which to keep his book, when there was an unscheduled inspection by the chief of the prison. His eagle eye noticed immediately, "But you are an astronomer," 
Yes. Take this book away from him. But its mystical arrival had opened the way for his further work, which he then continued in the camp in Norilsk. And so now we should begin the chapter on the conflict between the soul and the bars. But what is this? The jailer's key is rattling brazenly in the lock. The gloomy block superintendent is there with a long list. Last name, first name, patronymic, date of birth, article of the code, term, end of term. Get your things together. Be quick about it. Well, brothers, a prisoner transport. A prisoner transport. We're off to somewhere. Good Lord bless us. Shall we gather up our bones? Well, here's what. If we are still alive, then we'll finish this story another time. In part four. If we are still alive. End of part one. Part two. Perpetual motion. And then we see it in the wheels. The wheels, which never like to rest, the wheels. How heavy are the stones themselves, the millstones. They dance in merry ranks, the millstones. W. Muller. Chapter One. The Ships of the Archipelago. Scattered from the Bering Strait almost to the Bosporus are thousands of islands of the spellbound archipelago. They are invisible, but they exist. And the invisible slaves of the archipelago, who have substance, weight, and volume, have to be transported from island to island just as invisibly and uninterruptedly. And by what means are they to be transported? On what? Great ports exist for this purpose, transit prisons. And smaller ports, camp transit points. Sealed steel ships also exist. Railroad cars, especially christened Zack cars, prisoner cars. And out at the anchorages, they are met by similarly sealed, versatile black mariahs rather than by sloops and cutters. The Zack cars move along on regular schedules, and whenever necessary, whole caravans, trains of red cattle cars, are sent from port to port. Along the routes of the archipelago, all this is a thoroughly developed system. It was created over dozens of years, not hastily. Well-fed, uniformed, unhurried people created it. The Kineshma convoy waits in the Moscow Northern Station at seventeen hundred hours on odd-numbered days to accept black mariahs from the Butyrki, Krasnaya Preznia, and Taganka prisons. The Ivanovo convoy has to arrive at the station at 0600 hours on even-numbered days to receive and hold in custody transit prisoners for Nerechta, Bezhetsk, and Bologoye. All this is happening right next to you. You can almost touch it, but it's invisible, and you can shut your eyes to it too. At the big stations, the loading and unloading of the dirty faces takes place far, far from the passenger platform. And is seen only by switchmen and roadbed inspectors. At smaller stations, a blind alleyway between two warehouses is preferred, into which the black mariahs can back, so that their steps are flush with the steps of the Zack car. The convict doesn't have time to look at the station to see you or to look up and down the train. He gets to look only at the steps, and sometimes the lower step is waist high, and he hasn't the strength to climb up on it. And the convoy guards who have blocked off the narrow crossing from the Black Maria to the Zack car growl and snarl, "Quick, quick, come on, come on!" and maybe even brandish their bayonets. And you, hurrying along the platform with your children, your suitcases, and your string bags, are too busy to look closely. Why is that second baggage car hitched onto the train? There is no identification on it, and it is very much like a baggage car. And the gratings have diagonal bars. And there is darkness behind them, but then why are soldiers, defenders of the fatherland, riding in it? And why, when the train stops, do two of them march whistling along on either side and peer down under the car? The train starts, and a hundred crowded prisoner destinies, tormented hearts, are borne along the same snaky rails, behind the same smoke, past the same fields, posts, and haystacks as you, and even a few seconds sooner than you.
But outside your window, even less trace of the grief which has flashed past is left in the air than fingers leave in water. And in the familiar life of the train, which is always exactly the same, with its slit-openable package of bed linen and tea served in glasses with metal holders, could you possibly grasp what a dark and suppressed horror has been born through the same sector of Euclidean space just three seconds ahead of you? You are dissatisfied because there are four of you in your compartment and it is crowded. And could you possibly believe, and will you possibly believe when reading these lines, that in the same size compartment as yours, but up ahead in that Zack car, there are fourteen people? And if there are twenty-five? And if there are thirty? The Zack car. What a foul abbreviation it is. As for that matter, all the executioners' abbreviations... They meant to indicate that this was a railroad car for prisoners, for Zaklio Chenye. But nowhere except in prison documents has this term caught on and stuck. The prisoners got used to calling this kind of railroad car a Stolypin car, or more simply, just a Stolypin. As rail travel was introduced more widely in our fatherland, prisoner transports changed their form. Right up to the 90s of the last century, the Siberian prisoner transports moved on foot or by horse cart. As far back as 1896, Lenin travelled to Siberian exile in an ordinary third-class passenger car with free people all around him and shouted to the train crew that it was intolerably crowded. The painting by Yaroshenko, which everyone knows, Life is Everywhere, shows a fourth-class passenger car re-equipped in very naive fashion for prisoner transport. Everything has been left just as it was and the prisoners are travelling just like ordinary people except that double gratings have been installed on the windows. Cars of this type were used on Russian railroads for a very long time, and certain people remember being transported as prisoners in just such cars in 1927, except that the men and women were separated. On the other hand, the S.R. Trushin recalls that even during Tsarist times, he was transported as a prisoner in a Stolypin car, except that, once again going back to legendary times, there were six people in a compartment. Probably this type of railroad car really was first used under Stolypin, in other words, before 1911, and in the general cadet revolutionary embitterment, they christened it with his name. However, it really became the favourite means of prisoner transport only in the 20s, and it became the universal and exclusive means only from 1930 on, when everything in our life became uniform. Therefore, it would be more correct to call it a Stalin car rather than a Stolypin car, but we aren't going to argue with the Russian language here. The Stolypin car is an ordinary passenger car divided into compartments, except that five of the nine compartments are allotted to the prisoners. Here, as everywhere in the archipelago, half of everything goes to the auxiliary personnel, the guards. And compartments are separated from the corridor, not by a solid barrier, but by a grating, which leaves them open for inspection. This grating consists of intersecting diagonal bars like the kind one sees in station parks. It rises the full height of the car, and because of it, there are not the usual baggage racks projecting from the compartments over the corridor. The windows on the corridor sides are ordinary windows, but they have the same diagonal gratings on the outside. There are no windows in the prisoners' compartments, only tiny barred blinds on the level of the second sleeping shelves. That's why the car has no exterior windows and looks like a baggage car. The door into each compartment is a sliding door, an iron frame with bars. From the corridor side, all this is very reminiscent of a menagerie. Pitiful creatures resembling human beings are huddled there in cages, the floors and bunks surrounded on all sides by metal grills, looking out at you pitifully, begging for something to eat and drink, except that in menageries they never crowd the wild animals in so tightly. According to the calculations of non-prisoner engineers, six people can sit on the bottom bunks of a Stolypin compartment, and another three can lie on the middle ones, which are joined in one continuous bunk, except for the space cut out beside the door for climbing up and getting down, and two more can lie on the baggage shelves above. Now, if, in addition to these eleven, eleven more are pushed into the compartment, the last of whom are shoved out of the way of the door by the jailer's boots as they shut it, then this will constitute a normal complement for a Stolypin prisoner's compartment. This book is continued on Cassette 7, 